Okay, so in this video, we're going to start our next half of the thermal physics unit, um, and we're going to be talking about uh, the behavior of ideal gases. Okay, now we've talked uh, about gases before, and we've seen previously that in a gas, uh, the atoms or molecules making up the gas are all basically separated from each other, and they're moving freely from each other. And if you have a container of gas, We've talked about how the pressure of the gas is related to the frequency of collisions that those gas particles make with their container walls, and that the temperature of the gas is related to the average kinetic energy of the particles. And of course, that, that last one, temp temperature of any anything is related to the average kinetic energy of the particles making up the object. Um, but so far, we've been really focused on the microscopic picture of things okay that is the behavior of like the individual particles making up a gas um, so a couple things first of all we, we want to be able to talk about more macroscopic concepts and when I say macroscopic I mean like human sized um, kind of ideas and, and concepts so for example we can't see like individual gas particles moving around bouncing off of each other okay so we want to think of things in a more macroscopic way um, and so we'll, we'll talk about pressure in a more macroscopic way, and then after that we'll, we'll start talking more about ideal gases and some of the properties of what's called an ideal gas. Okay, so let's talk about pressure in a more macroscopic way. We know if we have a gas particle in a container, that the gas particle is going to be moving around the container like this. It's going to be moving randomly, and it's going to be colliding with the container walls. Okay, because the direction of the gas particle is always changing, that must mean that it is accelerating every time it bounces off one of the walls, and therefore there is a force from the wall of the container, excuse me, from the wall to, uh, of the container onto the gas particle, which means that the gas particle itself is also exerting a force on the walls of the container. Okay, and so we, we kind of talk about the idea of pressure in this context being given by this formula. Okay, so P is pressure, and we define pressure to be the force uh, per unit area um, exerted on an object. Okay, and so this, uh, in the context of this, F would be the, the force acting on the walls coming from the collisions of the gas particles, and A would be like the area impacted by the, uh, by the collision. Okay, now from the equation P equals F over A, we can see that the SI unit for pressure would be Newtons, because that's the unit for force, divided by area, and the unit for area, of course, is square meters. And so Newton, uh, Newtons per square meter is the unit for pressure, but we give that a special name. We call that Pascals. Okay, and so if we say one newton per meter is one pascal. So one newton per meter equals one pascal, and for pascal we write pa. Okay, and so just to kind of summarize everything in this equation, we have a little chart um, that's helpful to look at. Okay, so make sure you add that to your notes. Okay, and so this is talking about pressure in terms of uh, force spread out over an area. Okay, and in the context of a gas, of course, the force is coming with the gas particles colliding with this, the sides of the container, but you can also use this, this concept of pressure on a more macroscopic level. And so here's an example of that. Okay, so for instance, let's say you have a, um, a man standing on one foot on some ice, and let's say the man has a mass of 150 kilograms. Okay, so if we assume that his foot is a rectangle that is 9 centimeters by 10 centimeters, which would be kind of weird, okay, but let's go with it, then we can find the pressure exerted on the ice. Okay, and so pressure is force per unit area, and so the force from a 150 kilogram man would be his weight, his force of gravity, and so you can see on this line here the calculation of that force. The area of his foot, at least in square centi or, uh, square meters, um, would just be length times width. You can see the calculation here. Notice that in this calculation, you have to convert centimeters to meters, which they do. And then the pressure would just be the force per unit area. And so it would be 170,000 pascals um, would be the pressure on his foot. 
Okay, and so that's the, again force per unit area. His his entire body weight is spread out over um, over that area, and so that is the pressure. Now, what if he put uh, his other foot down so he was standing on two feet? Obviously, the force would be the same, but the pressure would be spread out over twice as much area, and so the pressure would be um, you know half half as big. Okay, now what if um, what if he's wearing a special type of shoe? So this is actually called a snowshoe. And so here, this is like the next part of this example. It says if the ice is thin enough that it will break under a pressure of 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals, what should be the area of a snowshoe that will just prevent him from breaking through one on one foot? Okay, and so the force would be the same. We want uh, the pressure to be no more than 1 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And so we can calculate the area of the snowshoe that would be required uh, for that situation. So basically what the snowshoe does, as you can see from the picture, is it goes on your foot. And the, the snowshoe has a bigger area. And because it has a bigger area, it kind of distributes that same force over a bigger area. And so the pressure on the ice is actually decreased. Okay, and so you can wear these special s snowshoes so that when you're walking on the snow, um, you don't sink into the snow, basically. And so that's basically like the, the macroscopic view of pressure, not pressure of a gas, but just kind of pressure in general. Um, there's different units of pressure that you might have heard of before. Um, the SI unit for pressure, of course, is Pascal's. Okay, but there's also units that you might have heard of in chemistry or just in your daily life. You might have heard of atmospheres. One t ATM is called one atmosphere. Okay, that's basically atmospheric pressure um, that I'll talk about in just a minute. One atmosphere is equal to 101,325 pascals. Um, it's also equal to 14.7, what's called PSI. PSI, a lot of people have heard of PSI. Um, PSI is a unit of pressure that stands for pounds per square inch. And so rather than newtons per square meter, you have pounds per square inch. Um, and then millimeters of mercury is, um, is like an older unit of pressure. Okay, so there's lots of different units of pressure. The one that we're going to use the most often is Pascal's. Now, it says right here that one ATM, one atmosphere, is equal to this number of Pascal's. So let's talk about why, um, why is that? What, what does that mean, atmospheric pressure? And so you can imagine that humans, um, you know, if you go in the water and you go swimming, if you dive down deeper, you might feel... A greater amount of pressure and the reason that you feel more pressure as you go deeper into the water and in fact if you go too deep your ears start to pop and you start to really feel the pressure the reason is that you have all of that fluid um, pushing down on you and so you're basically like being pushed on by the weight of all of that fluid and so the deeper you go the more fluid there is above you and so the greater the pressure is okay Atmospheric pressure has to do with the fact that we actually live, humans actually live at the bottom of an ocean. Okay, but not an ocean made of water, but an ocean made of air. And so, if you imagine uh, there's air all around us, but also going all the way up into space, there's also air from, from where we are at sea level all the way up into space. And so we actually live at the bottom of an ocean filled with air. And so the, the weight of the, the air is pushing down on us and that's what's called atmospheric pressure and a lot of people don't think of that because you, you don't really notice it because we're used to to uh, living at the bottom of that ocean so we don't really notice that pressure um, but if you go higher up into the atmosphere then the pressure actually decreases because then there's less air pushing down on you because you're you're now above some of the air and so that's why when you go hiking up into the mountains for example there's less air pressure it can be harder to breathe um, and stuff like that and that's also one reason why when you go like in an airplane usually they pressurize the cabin and so um, you don't necessarily notice the difference in air pressure when you're flying on a plane because they, they intentionally like change the pressure inside to match what it normally is because otherwise people would would be having some issues All right so um, we talked about the microscopic uh, viewpoint of things, the scale of individual atoms or molecules. Um, we've also talked about the macroscopic perspective. Uh, 
um, at least as term, in terms of pressure. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is ideal gases. Okay, and there's something called the kinetic theory of gases. Um, and so on this slide, there's basically just some information that you need to add to your notes. All right, so let's start with this. If you have um, a gas which um, obeys what's called the kinetic theory, then that gas can be considered what's called an ideal gas. Okay, now in an ideal gas, the internal energy of an ideal gas consists only of kinetic energy. In other words, we know internal energy is, you know, the kinetic energy of all the atoms or molecules making up an object plus the internal potential energy of all the atoms or molecules making up an object. For an ideal gas, there is no internal potential energy. Okay, we assume it's zero in what's called an ideal gas. Okay, and the reason is that potential energy comes from the, the intermolecular forces, the electric forces between the atoms and molecules. Um, and in an ideal gas, we assume that we assume that those forces don't exist. All right, so um, we'll talk more about you know the kinetic theory of gases in just a second. But basically, you can treat a gas as an ideal gas um, as long as it has a relatively low pressure, low density, and moderate temperature. Okay, and the reason for that is in an ideal gas. Um, again, the, the key idea of an ideal gas is that we're assuming that the gas particles don't interact with each other. Now, in a real gas, that's not necessarily the case. In a real gas, the gas particles do interact with each other because there's like electrical forces that act between the gases. Okay, but if you have a low pressure gas or you have a low density gas, in other words, if the gas is so like dilute, if it's so spread out, then you can ignore those um, electrical interactions and you can treat a gas as an ideal gas. Okay, and the reason we might want to do that is because ideal gases have um, certain properties that make them very easy to deal with. Okay, for example, they only have internal kinetic energy rather than internal potential energy. Now, is there any such thing as a real ideal gas? Well, not really, um, but Again, if you meet, if you have a gas that meets certain criteria, like here, then you can treat it as an ideal gas for the reasons that I talked about. Okay, so the assumptions we're making under the kinetic theory of gases are these. Okay, we are assuming that our container of gas has a large number of identical gas particles. We're assuming that the volume of the gas particles are negligible. We're assuming that the motion of the gas particles is random, that there's no force between the gas molecules. That's That one is probably the most important because um, that's one of the key differences between an ideal gas and a real gas. Because if this one is not true, then that means there is internal potential energy between the gas particles. And then finally, we're assuming that the gas particles, even though they might be colliding with each other, we're assuming that those collisions are elastic, which we know from previous units, elastic collisions, meaning kinetic energy, is conserved in those collisions. Okay, And so if we can go along with these assumptions, then we have an ideal gas. Now, it's really important that you understand these are the assumptions we're making about um, an ideal gas. That's not the same thing as as having like a container of real gas and knowing the circumstances under which you can treat a real gas as an ideal gas, which we talked about on this slide here. Okay, and so sometimes you have questions asking you, like, under which circumstances can a can a gas be treated as an ideal gas? Those are asking these about these kind of concepts versus these are just the assumptions that we're making under the kinetic theory of gases. Okay, now we're, I'm only going to bring up one more uh, concept just kind of briefly and we'll go into more detail in future uh, videos. Okay, but I want to talk about the concept of the mole. Okay, and so we're going to talk more about ideal gases and the ideal gas law and what we can do with ideal gases 
um, since we just spent all this time talking about ideal gases. But before we do that, it might be beneficial to discuss the concept of the mole and molar mass. Okay, the mole is one of the seven SI fundamental units that we talked about at the beginning of the, of the year. Okay, so you have the meter, the second, the kilogram, um, the mole, Kelvin, candela, and ampere. Okay, those are the seven SI base units. Okay, the mole is defined in this way right here. It is defined as the amount of any substance that contains as, as many elementary entities as there are atoms in 12 grams of pure carbon-12. And I, I always say definitions are important, so do make sure you know the definition of the mole. Um, what the heck does that mean? Okay, the amount, so first things first, what is a mole measure? Okay, the mole is a measurement of amount. It's defined as the amount of any substance that contains as many elementary entities as there are atoms in 12 grams of pure carbon-12. All right, so if you're thinking about that, then you should ask the question, well, how many atoms are there in 12 grams of pure carbon-12? Because that's really the number that we're talking about here, right? Okay, so how many atoms are there in 12 grams of pure carbon-12? Well, it turns out that the number of atoms that we have in 12 grams of carbon-12 is approximately equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And this number is what's called Avogadro's number. You might have seen it before in chemistry. We write Na for Avogadro's number. And again, that is approximately how many atoms there are uh, how many carbon atoms there are in 12 grams of pure carbon-12. Why is it defined in terms of carbon-12? I don't know exactly. I'm sure there's some interesting historical reason for that, but I don't teach chemistry, so I don't know what the reason is. Now, what a lot of people don't understand about moles is that a mole is just a counting number. A mole is the SI unit for amount or quantity. Okay, so for example, a dozen is a counting number. A dozen is 12. You can have a dozen flowers, or you can have a dozen pairs of shoes, or you can have a dozen donuts. Okay, either way, it's still 12. A mole is the exact same thing, except instead of the number being 12, it's Avogadro's number. Okay, so a mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of that something. Okay, and a lot of people learn about moles in chemistry, but they don't really understand what that is. Okay, so now I'm telling you, it's basically a counting number. Okay, it's a grouping number. Okay, so here you can see, like, here are some other examples. A pair of shoes. What does a pair mean? A pair means two. Okay, a dozen means 12. Okay, a baker's dozen is 13. A score, like, you know, four score and, you know, seven years ago, a score is 20. A gross is 144. A mole is... 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And so I could say, you know, go buy me like a, a mole of donuts, and I would be asking for 6.02 times 10 to the 23 donuts. Now, that's not physically possible, of course, but just to understand the concept of what a mole is. Okay, it's a counting number. Okay, so just to do a few simple examples. Example one, it says an aqueous solution. Some of you are like, you know, cringing now because I'm bringing chemistry into it, but it is what it is. An aqueous solution contains 0 0.25 um, moles of iron. Okay, calculate the number of iron atoms present in the solution. All right, well, if you understand the concept of a mole as a counting number, this is a very simple type of problem. We have 0.25 moles of iron. Okay, now, what do I know about a mole of iron? Well, I know that a mole is just a counting number, and a mole of anything, whether it's, you know, iron atoms or, you know, flowers, is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 of that something. And so one mole of iron atoms is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 iron atoms. Okay, and so if you just put that into the calculator, you'll have the answer. All right, and so let's see, I get a value of 1.51 times 10 to the 23 iron atoms, and I'm done with the problem. 
Okay, and so that is it for example one. Pause there if you need to look at that some more. And let's take a look at one more quick example. This is actually from a past IB um, exam. This is one of those questions where I always tell you definitions are important. So pause it here and try to answer this question on your own. Okay, so the question says the mole is defined as blank. Okay, now if you look in your notes, um, then you should know that the answer to this question is B. Okay, the mole is defined as the amount of a substance that contains as many elementary entities as the number of atoms in 12 grams of the isotope carbon-12. Now, we don't know what an isotope is. We'll talk about that later. Okay, but that is how it's defined. Remember, definitions are important. Okay, A and B, or sorry, A and C should be out because mole has nothing to do with mass. Okay, the mole is not a measurement of mass. It's a measurement of amount. It is, it is the SI unit for amount or quantity just like kilogram is the SI unit for mass okay so a and c should be out and then d just doesn't fit the definition okay so definitions are important all right so pause it there make sure you've taken good notes okay we're going to go ahead and stop the video here in the next video we will talk more about molar mass and do more calculations involving moles as always, please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you guys in the next video.